Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of the Leaders in Supply Chain podcast. I'm your host, Radu Palamariu, and delighted to have with us today Sven Markert, who is the Chief Supply Chain Officer of Siemens Smart Infrastructure. Sven has spent many, many years in supply chain, close to 20 with Siemens itself in a variety of roles, has a fascinating career, and I'm looking forward to this discussion. Sven, thanks for joining us. Hi, Rado. Thanks for inviting me. I feel so honored having the chance to talk with you. My sure, sure, it would be nicer. Yeah, sure, it would be nicer face to face and not with these podcasts with a glass of red wine. But okay, now we are here in a, a studio making the podcast. But I think imagination will make it happen. Uh, <laughs> so everyone listening, yeah. And imagine us, Rado and me, sitting at a bar, a smoker's lounge, nice, sunny, warm weather somewhere around the world, maybe Singapore, kind of sea breeze and an amazing glass of red wine. So that's the imagination for this podcast. But now let's talk about supply chain. <laughs> Love it. Well, that's, that's quite a setup. So we need to do that in real life one of these days soon. And yes, in the meantime, wanted to, to start this chat with asking you, you've done a lot of things in your, in your career. You've also had your own business. You know, you've, you've been also in CFO position. You've been 20 years with Siemens. When you look back, what are one or two of your key inflection points that, you know, when, when you look in the past, you, you figure out that, wow, this was really important and it helped me most in my career? Yeah, that's a very difficult question to really highlight one or two and the whole business life. But let me start with the most important. And I think that was also something what really shaped me. I'm a proud father of two kids, a girl, 16, you can imagine. 16 year old yeah. girl huh? and growing from yeah, zero to 16, a 14 year old boy, that shaped me. And that shaped me also during the last year since, since they were born, because this was such an, an amazing moment when they were born that shaped me. But also, I don't know, maybe it shaped me. I'm born in 74, so 1974. You might remember Germany was winning the World Soccer Championship. So I was a kid of the, of the year of the World Championship that also shaped me. But coming back to business, yeah, more than 30 years in business and not having 30 years of experience with that age, yeah, yeah, 30 years in business, saying, hey, I started with an apprenticeship as a forwarding agent, very, very young and yeah, didn't know from school-wise, hey, what to do, said, okay, yeah, now I stop school after this gymnasium right in front of the the Matura. And then I said, oh, no, let's, let's start a forwarding agent thing. And I cut this really short one and a half years starting in the forwarding business, really from scratch. And with all the funny things, what do you experience being an apprentice? Yeah, they they send you in the warehouse that you should find that and that and that funny things no one knows about. And then yeah. that shaped me really, yeah, these starting from the scratch. They thought, okay, yeah, what to do? Then I was in that years and that also shaped me. I was doing a lot. I was always curious, even in a very young age with the 18 years old, I was also co-owner of a disco. So also that things I tried <laughs> out. And then I said, okay, let's be, let's start forwarding logistics business. As you said, yeah, self-employed co-owner of a forwarding company, logistics business, rule them together for some years. I also continued my journey. And at the end, yeah, as you said, started with Siemens now much more than 20 years working in that great company and also there I started in the consulting business. I think as many of us started in the consulting business in supply chain and then, yeah, grew my career within Siemens. Two main points would say, hey, the first of all was really my change in the first senior leadership role. Yeah, I had this consulting team, we shared services, many, many various roles. But then a CFO from a business unit called me and I was beginning of 30 and he called me, hey, Sven, didn't you always wanted to come and to join us? I opened the, the role of the business unit logistics head, a business unit, whatever, around about one and a half billion euro business and uh, changing also my whole setup said, hey, yeah, sure. Didn't thought a minute about that. I said, hey, sure, I will join that business unit that will come, I will, I will do it really jumping into the water. And, and that, that shaped me. And that was really a moment within Siemens when he called and said, Hey, 
Didn't you want to, to join us? That was amazing. And then another story, and that's not, not really so far away. That was a story becoming the, the EVP and head of supply chain, what we call a chief supply chain officer of smart infrastructure. That was a reorganization. Siemens reorganized, and we do reorganize in quite a lot, but now stable since more or less four and a half, five years, and we will hopefully continue to be stable. But we reorganized Siemens. And I was uh, before the vice president of the building technologies division and supply chain, and then reorganization, knowing, okay, that will not exist. That role, that job will not exist anymore and transformation needed. So mm. didn't know if I would be chosen, didn't know if I would be chosen as the new head of supply chain of the as the EVP there. And then I said, hey, having fear, seeing a, a big rock, seeing a mountain, a big, big challenge in front of me, oh, I can climb it. And that was a moment that shaped me. And I said, no, clearly not. Yeah, fear is not a good companion. I saw it as an opportunity. I saw it really, hey, new structures, good structures, the right one, lots of opportunities, lots of possibilities to shape mm. the company. And I said, hey, let's prepare everything. Let's prepare the transformation. If you're choosing or not, doesn't really matter. I had then, then interviews with HR, what we here in Siemens call people and organization. I had the interview of the managing board member with the CFO and didn't know if I got the job. But I pushed the transformation. I pushed everything. But then had my last steering committee, last steering committee presenting, hey, what should the structure look like? And also there were other applicants for that job and presented it. I was on my way to Frankfurt. Uh, I was in the car and said, boy, I needed holiday, holiday, I needed holiday. On my way to Frankfurt, said, hey, I need some relaxing time flying to Florida, flying to Orlando as, yeah looking nice weather, sunshine, beach, theme parks, everything. And I said, okay, now let's do the steering committee at a parking lot, Frankfurt Airport, did mm. everything. And then I was flying to Orlando. And then, yeah, relaxing a little bit, didn't hear anything. I was staying there some days. And then it was four o'clock in the morning, my phone rang and the CFO was in the line. I was at the uh, Cabana Bay Beach Resort saying, oh, okay, well, four o'clock in the morning, immediately awake. And he said, hey, Sven, we have made a decision. You have the job. Mm -hmm. And that, imagine four o'clock in the morning, that shapes you, that shaped me. I was immediately awake with that relaxing environment and said, oh, wow, wow. Now, now I even enjoyed more than my holidays. But really, that were two moments taking over the business unit logistics get the call from a business unit CFO and the second one in my Siemens career when I really drove and, and, and was pushing the transformation, setting it up, doing everything what's possible, then said, oh, I need holiday. And then four o'clock in the morning, US time, the phone rang, CFO on the line said, oh, you have the job. And then these mm. two moments that shaped me really. Super. Love it. Then speaking specifically over the last two, three years, which have been intense for you, for your team, for everybody, really, what would be one or two examples within Siemens of perhaps keeping it very practical, case studies of transformation or projects that you've embarked on and are very proud of and, you know, you've, you've achieved, you've turned around in the last two, three years? Yeah, there's so many. Yeah. First of all, I'm, I'm proud that we shaped the team and we really shaped the workforce during and, and really motivated the workforce during the COVID time. That was an amazing experience. Yeah, that's people is so important. But that's by let's put that by side because people is the most important. I can talk, I could talk hours about people and my passion for leadership. But looking at the main challenges in the last three, four years, starting with COVID. And I think everyone was really, yeah, it came overnight, more or less overnight. COVID material situation, lockdowns. And there what we did, we said, hey, we cannot be a firefighters department. We have to look, we have to have a strategy, we have to have a plan and transforming the organization to a new normal. And one highlight was we had local, regional and local lockdowns, like everybody of us had. And we said, hey, we have to change immediately a forwarding company. And that example, it was Italy. 
said, hey, there was a local lockdown. The cross-stocking location of the forwarder was involved in that area for the lockdown. We couldn't really supply our customers in Italy. And we said, huh, what to do? Yeah. Then we called the, the colleagues. They were in home office in Italy. And could imagine and or, or remember the times in Italy, they had really, really big, big trouble at the beginning of Italy. A lot of people mm-hmm. dying, a lot of people, because that was one of the countries in Europe hit the most, and especially at the beginning. And then we called them, the organization said, yeah, trust me, I have a forwarding agent there and they're there. Change to that, that doesn't really matter if you have labels, doesn't really matter if you have any digitalization, we will make it happen. And then we changed and got so many, many, many good feedback from our customers because we were distributing electrical products and also building products to that thing. And they were really needed. And that that was an amazing moment where we did the transformation on a practical base. Mm. The second point, a bit more away from COVID, let's say going to the digitalization part. And I always say digitalization is not with the purpose of digitalization, You have to have a purpose. You have to do things with the digitalization. It's always people and digitalization. It's not that machine taking over everything and digitalization is the robot shaping the supply chain or people shaping the supply chain. And one particular transformation project was the reduction of the manual workload, what we did. So our so-called 360 program, combining the order to cash view with a purchase to pay view. So having the real end-to-end view in a solution, in a service, and in the project business. So a digital twin of our whole end-to-end supply chain and the program shaping together with our people that we reduce manual workload, we reduce the repetitive, really boring stuff in the workload of the people. So only repeating, pushing the button. And there we reduced a lot. We In the last two years, we have reduced the manual interactions in the, our supply chain about 300,000 per year, 300,000 manual steps we mm. did. We deleted in the supply yeah. chain and so freed up time for the people to do something else and to concentrate doing the right things and not doing really the things on these boring pushing the button tasks. So these two examples of the last two years, the one with the COVID, really practical one on the forwarding things with the message, trust the local people, trust the regional know-how. And the other one is also the digitalization things. Use the digitalization, use the transparency. It always starts with the transparency use the digitalization to help people doing the right things. Mm. And I, I'll stay with the second example for a second and double click a little bit and ask, what were the main challenges? So whilst we do say that change is the only constant, we as humans don't actually like change. <laughs> in, in fairness, yeah, we like stuff to, to stay the same if, it's, if it can. So what were some of the main challenges, perhaps even starting with the, the, the biggest challenges? How do you sell a project like that to the senior management to get their buy-in? And then maybe the second biggest challenge is typically how do you convince the organization that this is the right thing to do? Yeah. So, yeah, the, the challenge is always the change. And as you said, yeah, human beings, we don't like change. We want to have a, a constant view, a stable situation. And that's the the thing where we strive for to have a stable situation and no change. But okay, change will happen. Change is necessary. One of the biggest challenges is, and that's the challenge for every leader in my point of view, because it's not about the leader, it's about the followers. And the followers is up and down the ladder and there's all stakeholders. First of all, for me, the biggest challenge was creating and having a clear vision having a clear vision what to do and aligning the vision with the people because this is the most important and and, uh, framing it a little bit different, yeah? Saying, hey, it's not about the leaders, it's about the followers and imagine, hey, maybe a bad example with Germany and the soccer team, but I I take it. Imagine a soccer team wants to win the world championship and that's Mm -hmm. what I want to win the world championship. I want to, to change 
the team. I want to change really the culture here, and that's winning the world championship. So I'm the coach having the vision, winning the world championship. So can I win the cup on my own? Uh, for sure not. I need followers. I need the whole environment. And as you said, I also need the board members for that. So creating a, a clear vision and then aligning this vision with the follower, with the winning spirit. And, and I always say, hey, it's the board members. It's it's the even the warehouse workers. And bringing that to example with the soccer team, the coach has to have also the bus driver. You have also to need, you need the chef cooking the meals. You need the kit man preparing everything because you as a coach cannot make, make the goals. You cannot be, you're not the keeper. You cannot really do everything to win the world championship. And that's the same with the change here. So... I created a vision. I put this, I framed this really in a picture and a winning spirit and explained it to the board and said, hey, yeah, we don't want to be a firefighter. We don't want to stay always solving problems. We want to be ahead of the curve. Yeah, we want to strive for being a leader and being, yeah, outperforming that we are a customer's choice. And yeah, went to the board and framed it really that they understand. And then these, these, what I want to say is these, these examples with the world championship and the, the examples, what I say here in, in bringing it to the picture is the board has to understand it. So it's mm. about that speaking the language of the board or speaking the language of the people involved, of all the stakeholders. You have to phrase it and you have to put it in pictures so that they have understand it in their language apples mm. see of all you're talking about numbers you're talking about hard facts and some areas in our companies and maybe in others the same uh, see of all like figures and like excel spreadsheets and you're explaining yes. it with an excel spreadsheet you're going to the sales department you have to to frame it as maybe with the world championship in pictures you speak to the to the warehouse workers you have to phrase it what's in it for them and that's my approach, finding followers and speaking their language and driving this change. And that's the biggest challenge was change management. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and that's the big, really the biggest, biggest challenge. And that's all about it. The other biggest challenge was creating this winning spirit that because, yeah, you know, it's not only about the change, it's also about this winning spirit saying, hey, we want to reach something together and really, really aligning the team. It's about the same with the change management, but a bit different, painting the picture, having a common vision, explaining them what to do, why it's so important and how to do it. And then that was my, not only my, that was our trick to say, hey, creating this winning spirit, clear what we want to do, clear why is it important for the business why is it important if we not do it what is the risk if we we fail in that how do we measure how do we measure success so with the world how do we measure success it's yeah first you have to in the world championship first you have to have the first round you get to the finals then the semi-final then the final and then you have to win everything yeah so you have to qualify you stand the first round and then step by step so how to measure success at the end in that example is is winning the cup and in our example is the kpis what's success about maybe cost reduction maybe performance up and also in the sense of digitalization reducing the manual workloads counting that how many manual workloads to for example order lines purchase order lines how to to really free up time that's also so critical what to do, why is it so important, what's in it for you, and how we want to do it, and step-by-step step measuring the success. Love it. And when you think, when you think a little bit ahead, uh, yeah, in the next one, two years, what would you say is your one area of most focus where you want to improve or where you want to do the most, let's say, to push the boundaries even further within the Siemens smart infrastructure supply chain? <laughs> yeah, looking at the next two, three years, uh, I want to put it in, let's say, in three buckets. The first is like cleaning our, our teeth every day. That's ahead of us for me is really the topic of costs. Yeah. So having a clear 
to really phrase it, yeah, because it's not really that I, I see that we have a, such a high decline, but cost increase in transportation and warehousing. So inflation, these, the cost topic is a really critical topic for the next two, three years. Also looking at the inventory and the, the asset situation. Mm. So, but that's the base for us. That's the base, like cleaning the teeth every day. We have to do that. That's not always you like it but you have to do it so that's the yeah. first bucket cost because yeah supply chain will come back and i'll see it here it's already coming back we are a value creator and we are value creation but also cost control is is important the second bucket is really what i see what i want to drive and what's really close to my heart is the topic of sustainability creating a sustainable supply chain end to end from the beginning from the source and you also phrase it overall so from the source to the sold yeah to bring it a little bit also in your language saying from the source to the sold creating an end to end sustainable supply chain that's so close to my heart mm. reducing so decarbonization reducing the carbon emissions optimizing the carbon footprint up to reduce waste to landfill in the sustainable supply chain and also creating a culture of yeah, sustainable supply chain. And I don't want to use the word green. It's a sustainable end-to-end -end supply chain that I want to do and I want to drive in the next one, two years. And for sure, that's a journey and we will, we will not have a, a green, sustainable supply chain, fully zero emission in two years. That's a long-term journey, but that's a focus right now because I think we are still lacking in the supply chain with the topic of sustainability. We always say, oh, a business case, business case. We always want to have everything. So reduction of cost, uh, the reduction of emission, and always have to be a business case. And in that sense, I think sustainability is not a business case. Sustainability is something coming from the heart, and sustainability is our future. Last but not least, the third bucket from the base, from the what I want to do with the sustainability to the third bucket is people management. So I always say work of the future, future of work and workforce transformation. So work of the future, future of work, what's the future of work, and then transforming our workforce. And that's with Talent management and talent management is not always the young. And I, I, I read that. I don't know if I read it somewhere with you or somewhere around with Knut saying, hey, I'm a fed of always the list under the top below 40. You also have to, to look ahead. And in my view, it's also the gray hair talents or maybe also in the long term base, no hair, hair talents. So not always <laughs> the young talent, not always the, 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 the next generation. Also, you have to transform the workforce and having the right mix and the right balance of young, really wild uh, generations up to the gray hair, no hair talents. And I think I, some one of you phrased it also having a list about the people over 65 or 70 starting a new business. So and that's these, these workforce transformation for me. So talent management in a total Diversity in a total, not only gender diversity, so total diversity and the right skills for the future. And what I think personally, and we hear and, and, and we deep dive a little bit for the supply chain, skills of the future, automation skills, big data skills, digital literacy is, is so, so important. Digital leadership is so important. We were all thrown in this digital leadership, not really trained for that. COVID and the new work. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're sitting in front of a, a team's computer and making the team's meeting and making de trying out digital leadership around the world. Everyone sitting in the home office, all the kids around and then end. So digital leadership skills, that's so important. And last but not least, also referring to my second bucket was sustainability skills because we are all and i'm talking about sustainability and i'm talking about shaping a sustainable supply chain in the future and to be quite frank for to you i don't have any clue about sustainability i don't know what's the best using whatever corrugated material using that or that reducing plastic is it better to have plastic is it better to have 
whatever, some corrugated things and some packaging material as for packaging. I don't know, have a clue about sustainable air fuel, about that, that, that. So the sustainability skills, it's so important for supply chain people, in my point of view, to get this. So the three buckets, the base with the cost, uh, the sustainability, and last but not least, the most important, what I want to drive in the next two, one, two, three years is workforce transformation from work of the future to future of work. Mm. And I want to to stay a little bit with something that you said. Indeed, the people that are in the bucket of diversity, yeah, we talk a lot about gender and about race. We don't really talk a lot about age. This probably is mostly left out, to be honest. And specifically, I think it's, it's you know, you, you do get sometimes that you're too young to do something. But myself as an executive search, I do get a lot <laughs> from companies. And I'm sure you, you get it too on the other side, perhaps so as a hiring manager that, oh, they're too old, they're too senior, or, you know, they don't have much left in them, which I think is a gross misconception, because there's actually one, the older, let's say the older talent, to use uh, bluntly the term, yeah, though age is just a number, but they have a lot, a lot of experience and a lot of them have big fire in the belly. Yeah. And I do believe that indeed top 40 under 40 Forbes and whatnot is inspiring. But, you know, the guy that literally had somebody that commented that their father took their PhD at 82. I mean, that's even more inspiring. <laughs> and that's, yeah. uh, that's uh, you know, that's really breaking barriers. So I guess I wanted to stay with that topic and see if you within your career or within Siemens itself or with, you know, maybe you can think of some examples, concrete examples, right, of people that were perhaps past their, you know, they're no longer in their 20s, let's say, <laughs> but they would inspire and they would really be role models to the rest of the teams and did a fantastic job. Yeah, and I fully agree with all you, what you said, with all your statements. Um, looking back at my career and really remembering this, this what, what, what really popped up was becoming a business unit logistic had with the early 30s. Actually, it was 29, so started in October, that job and turning 30 in November. So that CFO trusted me that I'm not too young, that CFO trusted me that not about experience, that CFO trusted me about attitude. He wanted to change mm. something there, attitude. So I really love this guy saying, hey, yes. And not only because he trusted me, because he said, yeah, you're not too young. And that when you said, hey, in some steps, you're too young. And then then you're too old, too experienced, too senior, that, that, that. And I want to really take that example saying, hey, he trusted me that I'm not too young. And at the end, more or less, I, I think I delivered quite well. So also looking at my career. And the same, we now have to change with these things. Oh, you're too old, you're whatever, uh, 55, oh, yeah, you're, you're approaching the end of your business life. No, 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 that's not good. So we have to have the right mix of young people, really wild ones, so mix of the generations up to the middle ages, and really also from the experience age, I said, gray hair talents and so on. Uh, mm. That's so important, having these right mix and the right skill mix of all these skills. And I always say, yeah, you have to have cognitive skills, emotional skills, and uh, technical skills. And uh, a 70-year-old has the experience with all that. Maybe not the right technical skills, what, what our 30 years have with the newest AI technologies, but different skills. And the important is the mix. And what mm. inspired me, and I, I did this, one of my team members, and he's turning 65 this year, and I talked to him and I said, yeah, what do you want to do? Oh, you want to retire? And so and he said, oh, Sven, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm still have fire, still thing. And he said, yeah, you're doing a great job. I want to keep you. And then talked to, uh, I said, yeah, we call people an organization department because that's all about. It's about people and organization and not about human resources. So about people and organization. I talked to them and said, hey, could we extend this and prolong his contract up to 70 years? Ah, for sure, no problem. And then now we extended his contract for the next five years up to 70. So mm -hmm. that to really keep this and to have this, and he's such an inspiring person saying, I took that challenge, I did that and I did that. And that really is, is one example. Hey, I personally said, hey, extend his contract. 65 is not a, 
an age to retire. It's an age to start again. And he will for sure also have different roles in the next years and not stay with the same. He will also have new jobs and new even leadership roles or also individual contributor roles. Mm. And also on a bit, the thing on a bit of a, of a private life, yeah, and, and shaping that to the business. I've also one colleague and he was also one of my team members years and years back. Also there we go for a rafting trip every every year in Switzerland. And there are the young ones with whatever, 25, 30 years in the boat. And he is going to the Whitewater River rafting with really heavy, heavy white water. And he is now 73 and still joining us and still camping and still going into the raft and still making it. And that's the same here, having the raft and saying, there you have maybe one at the back with uh, 73 years and at the front facing the, the water, there you maybe have the 30 years old. And that's also one of the examples where I say, hey, that's drive with 73, going to the camping, going to the rafting, and that you have to bring into your mind also in business life, yeah? You're never yes. too old. Yeah? And it's about the, the right mix of also gender, culture, and also age. And we should really stop this, hey, you're too senior, you're too old, you don't know about the newest technologies. It's about having the right mix. Mm, exactly. I think you nailed the, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's exactly that, the right mix. And I've seen... We've worked recently on a on a role, and it was it was one of those uh, digital first logistics companies. Yeah, so they have plenty, <laughs> they have plenty of young talent inside the company, which is good. And what I was actually happy was I was you know also suggesting a couple of things, but the the board they were really on the same page with me when 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 I told them, look, you also need to make sure that you have some senior, seasoned, experienced professionals that come there and balance it out. Yeah. You need also the 60-year-old that has seen it all in the industry, that has maybe also a healthy degree of cynicism to also challenge sometimes the youngsters. And within this healthy tension, creating this healthy tension in the teams gets the best results. So I could not agree more. Having that mix is key, not having too much of any. And yeah, let's cut the too old for or too young for. <laughs> this is just, it's, it comes back to the attitude ultimately and to the team and to the right mix in the team. And on the note of, of asking you a, a last question in terms of what would be, Sven, some looking uh, looking at, uh, you know, and you've had a super successful career, you'll have, uh, you'll continue to have for many years. What would be one or two pieces of advice that you would give to somebody just graduating that from your own experience have helped you the most in your, in your pr professional life? Uh, uh, as you know, I'm not really the guy giving advice and say, hey, that's the best and that's the way how you should do it. Because I think it's always about also finding the own way. Uh, always doing it as the other did is, is the same thing. Hey, becoming a CEO and look what, what this CEO did and that, that, that. So I want not really an advice. I, I tell what was important for me. The first, yeah, finding my own way, doing what I think it's the right thing. And what I think is the right thing for me was always what I'm good at, what I love and what I have fun with, I'm good in. So mm -hmm. with these growth mindset, love what you do, have fun what you're doing, and then you will deliver the results and then you will, will really, really grow. Then the other thing, what I learned as a second and really not an advice, you always have to do it and, and find your own way is I was experienced is Closely listen to the people, closely listen to stakeholders, closely listen. And uh, one of my bosses always said, hey, Sven, you have two ears, you have one mouth, and you have a brain in between. So listen closely, listen, because you have two ears, yeah, listen, double, then you speak, and then use your brain in between. And that is also one thing what really said, hey, for me, listen treating the people like they want to be treated, thinking about it, and then communicating and then speaking and not speaking before I listen. And even uh, speaking without using brain is the worst one could do, I think. 
And last but not least, the third one you said too, but I, yeah, let's skip it there. So when the third one is always see opportunities and not challenges. That's it. Yes. I like the, the, yeah, you have, uh, we have two years and one mouth and yeah, one brain. So best to use it in the same proportion. <laughs> well, hopefully the brain more, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the ears more than the, more than the mouth, which I, I will admit for me, it's not always easy. I try to re remind myself. I, I also, yeah, I was told this many times. I'm still struggling with it, but hopefully sooner rather than later, <laughs> I, I learn it. <laughs> Well, on that note, Sven, thanks a lot. Great sharing session. Keep doing uh, and inspiring people to be better and pushing the boundaries at Siemens Smart Infrastructure. And it's been a delight to have you with us today. Thank you. Delight having with you a glass of red wine, talking to you. And now let's enjoy the rest of the day or evening. <laughs> Likewise. Take care, Sven. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you liked what you heard, be sure to go to www.elcotglobal.com and click the podcast button for all the show notes of the interview. Also, subscribe to our mailing list to get our latest updates first. If you're listening through a streaming platform like iTunes, Spotify or Stitcher, we would appreciate a kind review. Five star works best to keep us going and our production team happy. And of course, share it with your friends. I'm most active on LinkedIn, so do feel free to follow me. And if you have any suggestions on what, what to do and who to invite next, don't hesitate to drop me a note. And if you're looking to hire top executives in supply chain or transform your business, of course, contact us as well to find out how we can help.